Right, we're at 11.25, so I'd like to resume, please. <coughs> so, can I... Um, um, I'd just like, Miss Bartle, just to... If, the, if, if those additional four needed to be brought forward, Miss Bartle can show you how that can be accommodated, by the way, within the proposal. So I think it might be just worth hearing from her for a minute, just as to how that would happen. Before, before I do that, though, Miss Bartle, I, I just... Um, Carol approached me during the, during the break to say that there has been some difficulty for people up in the gallery hearing us. I know there have been some adjustments done to the PA in the break, um, but if everyone can try their best to speak um, loudly into the microphone, I think that would assist. Thanks. So, but, if I could ask you to go in the hearing statement to the responses to 1.4, 1.5 and 1.6 and table 2 which is, follows paragraph 1.6.3. Uh, Miss um, Martin, could you just uh, talk the inspector through what you talked me through during the coffee break, please? You have the table, yes. <laughs> okay, so table two is a, um, our um, presented rolling supply, which was also a version of this was presented in our December 22 response um, to confirm what our likely trajectory of provision would be. And you'll see at the, the, the top of the table, we've broken that requirement um, across the plan period down. And if we were to take the additional um, pitches and the undetermined category, um, we currently have two projected in, within the five-year period, um, but if we brought those additional two into that five-year period, we'd make that, um, we'd, we'd simply bring that additional five-year requirement up by two. Um, and you can see in the, um, the section below where we, we forecast the provision on particular strategic sites that we've identified those that are subject to financial contributions some of which fall outside of the five-year period. But as you've seen from the executive re report, the council's committed to forward funding these. So we could, as part of that, that provision could simply be brought forward into that five-year period, which would easily give us the headroom within the requirement that we need to provide that additional, um, those additional undetermined needs um, that we've said are, are later in the plan period, but if we were to bring them closer to the, within the first five years. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Sir, so, so can I just follow up on, on a couple of points? Two, um, they are the, the 11 pitches that we're talking about in that first column, top left-hand corner. They are, that, that is a need within the first five years in any event. Okay. Secondly, what we're not being told is where those pitches will be located. Um, because the requirement in paragraph 10A of PPTS is for the identification of a five-year supply of deliverable pitches or sites, but really pitches. So it, it's all very well saying, yeah, they can be accommodated, but, but where? And um, if it's either going to be forward funded or funded by the financial contributions coming forward from some of these strategic sites, it's pretty clear that they're going to be at Osbordwick. I mean, that seems to be the, uh, the, the default inference that we can draw. And then that's exactly the topic you're coming on to. I think that is right, is it, Ms Bartle? The, the 11 that's, that is referred to is um, non-definition requirements. And, and we've, we've already explained that, um, the, the, well, that the way the policy set out we have part A of policy, um, H5, that identifies the 10 going on the local authority pitches, um, which meets the definitional needs. <clears throat> and then we've demonstrated, again through this hearing statement and in our December response, that the additional um, requirements, um, which were now supported by the, the forward funding principle, um, could, if necessary, go on the Oswaldwick site. Um, 
which as Mr. Elvin has explained, is also subject to, to wider um, site search post adoption of the plan as well. So provision, it, so we have a, a, a capability of delivering them on the Osbaldwick site if necessary, um, but we, we maintain the view that we don't rely on setting that out any further in the policy when we don't believe that that's necessary for soundness to, to explicitly embed that in the, in the policy itself. I'm, I'm understanding that. Yeah, good. Can we, we move, we move on to, to, to Osbaldwick? I mean, ob obviously we, we went and, and had a look. I have had a look at the site previously um, in, in slightly drier conditions. Um, but, so I've seen it in, in so all, all I'm saying that for is I've, I've seen it when it's very wet. I've also seen it when it's quite dry. So, um, that was last year now. Um, there clearly is a, there's, there's clearly an issue being, being raised about its, its suitability for expansion. Um, I, don't, I don't really see it's the purpose of the, the, this plan examination to look at the existing site. The existing site is established and it's there. And if there, if there is an issue with conditions on site, well, that's really between the council as managers of the site and the, and the residents and, and, and so on. I'm not, I, I don't intend to look, look into the, the existing site, but I am obviously concerned about the expansion and whether it's, um, whether it's suitable for that. Now, I've read what, what people, people say and I've heard what Mr. Elvin said in, in, to begin with this morning, but um, I'd, like to I'd like to discuss this and I'd like to understand what everybody's position is on it, on it very clearly. And then there are some questions I want to I want to ask. So I'm going to come, Mr. Willers, to you first. And if you you can tell me what your Travellers Trust think about the potential expansion of that site. I mean, you might be able you might need to do that with reference to what happens now. Um, but you'll understand my position about the existing site. I hope. So the, so the existing site um, gives you a reference point, as it were, a starting point. And, um, <clears throat> and perhaps also um, an indication of the, the, the I suppose the concerns, the, the, the basis for the site residents' concerns that an additional 17, up to 17 pitches at, on the land adjacent um, will make that site even less manageable. And, um, and jeopardise their existing occupation of the site. Um, one only has to think back to 2013-14 when planning permission was granted, there was a hope, in fact, I think the intention to create an amenity space for children and the like. You've seen that piece of land um, on site when you visited. Um, it's got a poor record of management, that's accepted, but looking forward, the question I think for you, sir, is to consider not just the impact that 17 additional pitches up to 17 might have on the um, existing accommodation, which ought to be safeguarded, um, but, but also the living conditions of those um, who might occupy those pitches. And you know, you visited the site, I don't need to remind you about what you saw on the route up to it, or indeed the nature of the route itself. And I'm, I'm in danger of going over exactly what I said in the opening, really, that highway safety must be a prime consideration. There's no indication that there will be a footpath or footway provided for the site residents. There's no street lighting, the width of the road is, is not um, uh, what one would expect for the traffic that moves up and down that um, lane, HGV traffic, which um, uh, will visit the various uh, industrial units along that lane. It's inappropriate, um, we would suggest, for anyone, let alone a large uh, community of gypsies and travelers with children 
those who are disabled, those who are elderly, um, to be uh, required to live uh, at the end of that lane, um, putting their literally lives at risk every time they uh, take a trip to the shops or their children go off to school. And um, <laughs> when you couple that with the ongoing problems arising from the, um, the use of the neighbouring properties, which up until now has been uh, poorly regulated by the Environment Agency, for all manner of reasons, including, it seems, those which were identified by Mr. Elvin this morning, and the impact that will have on the lives and indeed the health of all of the members of the community that might be expected to live on those 17 pitches, but particularly those who are vulnerable to uh, pollution, including children who will um, no doubt be living on the site, then we would suggest that it clearly isn't an appropriate site for expansion. I've made other points, sir, about the views of the residents themselves and so forth, and my own friend said, well, York Travellers Trust have been involved throughout this process. But my point was that before putting forward Osbaldwick as a site for expansion, the residents were not consulted. They've only had to, as it were, through York Travellers Trust, object to the proposed modification after the event. One would expect a reasonable local authority to have consulted with the Osborne residents before even suggesting that any pitches be uh, uh, tagged on, as it were, to the existing um, poorly maintained and managed site. There are, there are obviously people who know a lot more about Osbordwick than, than I do, and it may be that um, one or two of them will want to say something more, particularly if they, I think, attended the site visit yesterday and I didn't. Um, well, firstly, I think Violet might uh, want to add to this uh, in a second, but what, what a main concern for me is that uh, we've been told that the, the, the expansion of Osbaldwick, that the site doesn't need to meet the criteria in policy H5C because it is a proposed allocation in the local plan. But during the site selection survey in 2014, it was, it was eliminated from that, from that site selection survey, and not because it was in the green belt, but because the size of the site already was going to make it too difficult to manage. Um, so, so the council seems to be trying to sort of say, well, we don't have to make a criteria-based assessment of this site, because it is allocated in the plan, but the way it's come to be allocated in the plan hasn't followed the, the, the correct process. That means it hasn't actually, it hasn't been tested against any of the standards that we'd expect. Um, and you know, as Mark said, and you saw it for yourself yesterday, you know, we work um, helping private families get planning permission for their sites. There's no way we'd put a site like that forward ever. You know, it doesn't have your access to services. It doesn't have highway safety. Um, the impact that it will have on existing residents, and I know we, we don't want to talk about sort of the, the condition physically of the existing site, but if policy, if the beginning of policy H5 expresses an intention to safeguard existing supply, I think we, it, it follows that the people who live in the existing supply are not going to be made worse off by the next section of the policy. Um, and you heard from them yesterday, unanimously, that's exactly what they expect, and I think you know, you'll have seen from the Freedom of Information request, the emails that we got, site managers, site managers and, and directors of the council also agree that expanding this site, even by any, by any pitches, is going to create huge problems in management. There's nothing, um, there's nothing we can do to kind of mitigate that within the local plan, basically. You know, the only thing we can we can do to Oswaldwick during this local plan process is make things worse, actually. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I do want to just start by saying that this is not the arena I'm normally sat in. Um, I'm just the CEO of a very small charity and a gypsy woman. So my colonially approved politeness might be a little bit off, so I apologise in advance. But I just want to say that in 2022, I asked Mr Jones directly if they have plans to extend Oswaldwick. And he said no. 
it was not part of the plan. That's how recent this knee-jerk, well, for us it feels very knee-jerk, response of saying, well, let's ex stand, extend Oswaldwick. And for me, working with the residents on a daily basis, I feel like the local authority have a duty of care and community cohesion for its most deprived ethnic minority groups. By ghettoising them further, you are condemning generations of people to live completely excluded from any other, any other group, any service provision, any access, any reasonable access to education. I mean, Gypsy and Traveller children are the most at risk within education system. We're currently doing, writing a report that shows that within New York it's even worse than nationally. It's not ready yet, sorry, I would have submitted it. If you can imagine living on that site and your car is broken down, are you gonna walk your child down that road to get them to school on a rainy day? That's what you're condemning generations of gypsy children to if you think that Oswaldwick is suitable for expansion. Every resident we speak to says the same thing. It needs a bomb putting on it. People don't live there because they like it. They live there because you've left them with no choice. And that's what this plan continues to do. Those are the only contributions um, from this side of the table. I'm going to come to Councillor Waters and then I'll come back to the Council on this, sorry. Thank you, sir. <coughs> um, just in response to what Violet said, I think out of sight, out of mind sums up the Osborwick site and has done for 40 years. Um, and also in relation to what Violet said about the assurances from Michael Jones. Well, I can well understand um, a housing officer saying that because that was the stated policy of the council as a corporate body going back to 2013. And that was the assurance given by the then chief executive when the chief executive at the time said, our proposals are to increase the site by six additional pitches. I also understand that Mr. Waddington who was a previous holder of Mr. Jones's position, set out that when looking at best practice from a management perspective, you would not bring forward proposals for a site larger than what is being proposed. That was for the 18 pitches after the expansion. Now, in terms of maintenance, I do apologise if it strays into the condition of the existing site, but it is important because... Homes and Communities Agency at the time, whatever they've called now, Homes England, they will not lend money for sites that are not properly maintained. In 2013, it actually went from, it went to ministerial level with the MP raising serious questions as to York Council's, I hate to use the term, management of the site because there hasn't been any management of the site. When York Council took over the site or assumed control of the site in 1996, it took barely 18 months before there were serious concerns about the condition of the site, which deteriorated rapidly from when Rydell were in control of it. The parish councils were involved. The City Council, and I think you'll find this interesting after your um, site visit and everybody's Wellington's uh, getting in the state they did, <coughs> The council in 1998 were going to um, spend capital funding on um, renovating the site and in particular the flooding and the drainage issues. 1998, I don't think you'll think that they've really been solved. In 2009, um, the Gypsy Council got involved raising serious issues about all of York's sites, but in particular, the Osborwick site. And it was the concerns of, of the situation that has arisen following transfer of management to York City Council. That was why in 2013, I was strongly advocating that management of the Osborwick site should go to a responsible gypsy traveller organisation because York Council had proved itself time and time again incapable of managing the site, incapable of actually maintaining the site. 
There was reams and reams of correspondence at the time in 2013 between the MP, the HCA, and as I say, it went to min ministerial level. The council gave various assurances to get that HCA money to expand the site on what it would do maintenance-wise. We've reached a situation 10 years on when these are the planning documents and the planning application that was approved. We couldn't even get the conditions that the council agreed to implemented. It's now a planning enforcement case, but because of the nature of such a case. But they are now saying that they will put up the security fencing around the site. Um, I don't know whether you, you saw the earth buns and the trees and hedgerows that were supposedly planted or the wildflower margins. None of it got implemented. <clears throat> if we go on to suitability of actually expanding the site, I'm sure you'll have seen on your, your site visit what surrounds the site. There's also a planning application at the moment for, I think it's 12 and a half acres of um, land immediately adjacent to um, the area that you looked at uh, for battery engineering storage system. Again, further industrialization of the site, making it even less attractive as a, as a place to live. The other major concern, certainly for, for people that live around the site, is in 2013, one of the, the major reasons for expanding the site was to in, include amenity space and land for grazing horses. If this site then is expanded further, how much of that land will be lost? We still have the problem of grazing horses, uh, fly grazing on the surrounding areas. Um, I got approached only, I think it was 10 days ago, by a lady who had been tripped up by a chain from a tethered horse across the footpath at the entrance to Outgang Lane, which you'll have seen. That's currently with the council's insurers. Now, in terms of management, um, I've got a letter electronically from the chief constable from, uh, it's probably two months ago, which I can send you if, if you wish, or the rest of the inquiry. There was a, a, a spate of um, farm and equestrian robberies uh, caused great distress, great alarm in the local area. And I'll stress now, it was nothing to do with any of the occupants on the Oswaldwick Gypsy site, but unfortunately, some of the items were dumped on there by other people. I would question what management there is on a site when you can't spot horse trailers, you can't spot large general trailers, and you can't spot vehicles that's been left on a site. And it took vi vigilante action for people to actually go to that site to actually get the police to attend to, to retrieve those items back. And again, I'll stress it had nothing to do with the occupants on that site. But it's a good demonstration of the lack of management and the lack of knowledge of what's actually going on on that site. I think that'll suffice for now, sir. Um, I could have brought four or five box loads of files, but I uh, did restrict myself. I didn't want to spoil your day. Thank you, Councillor Waters. Um, Mr. Mr. Newby, I'll, co I'll come to you. And maybe Thank you, Mr. sir. Yeah. Um, really following on from Councillor Waters' um, uh, uh, comments uh, just now, um, as a, an owner of the adjacent land, I uh, just thought I'd give you some background uh, as to what we've experienced over the last 40 years. Um, the, the phase one of the Gypsy site was compulsory purchase from my family back in the 80s against our wishes as you might expect uh, and what's followed over the last 40 years has been very poor management uh, by the council 
uh, from which we've suffered continual trespass on our land from grazing of travellers' horses and tipping of rubbish, most severely during the COVID, when a fridge mountain appeared and was burnt, resulting in contamination of the land in a number of locations. The council obviously had to clear that up at a considerable expense. In addition, um, when phase two was given planning permission, as uh, Councillor Waters has already mentioned, um, it was not adequately implemented and it's had a lack of appropriate and approved fencing around the site, which again would have protected our, our adjacent land. And uh, as, as Councillor Waters mentions, it's actually a subject of an enforcement case uh, against, against themselves, as it were. Um, all of these issues have prevented my family from obtaining a market value for the land. And, and whilst I hear the Council's intentions on future maintenance uh, going forward, you can understand my scepticism over the Council's ability to manage the existing site, let alone an extension. Our view is that the existing site in any proposed extension is, in, is inappropriately located in terms of amenity of the residents. A new, more appropriately planned site should be found elsewhere within the city. Thank you. Right, Mr. Alvin, I'm going to come, come to you to um, deal perhaps with those matters and what the council's position is on, on this, this existing site. Firstly, so far as Mr. Newby's concerns, uh, the site is there, it has permission, and it's safeguarded by H5, so the site is not going to move. Um, secondly, with regard to other points that have been raised, uh, can I remind you um, of uh, uh, the test for deliverability in footnotes four and five of the PTS, PPTS? Um, I is a realistic prospect, uh, and it should be a suitable location and there should be a reasonable prospect that the site is available, well, we know it is, and could be viably developed at the point envisaged. And that requires you to take into account the council's plans um, and the capital expenditure which is proposed. And although Mr. Willers has gone again at length about the uh, issues at the site, he again chooses to ignore the executive report particularly paragraphs 28 and 29, which says uh, there'll be a, a full survey of the site. The data will be considered alongside the views of the residents of the sites to help identify areas for priority investment. This could be improvements to pedestrian access, street lighting, hard and soft landscape area, facilities for children. The uh, case then night needs to be developed, but they're looking at an investment budget of about 30,000 per plot both to upgrade existing pitches and the overall quality of the sites, including access arrangements. This equates to a total improvement expenditure of about 1.8 million, including front-funded investment for additional pitches, which creates the broad uh, investment uh, envelope, it's called, of about 5.25 million. This is, not, this is a matter which the council is, perhaps you may think, a little late in the day, but is grasping the nettle. It has identified the broad levels of expenditure that is going to be required. It is looking to forward fund these matters and not wait for Section 106 uh, contributions. Uh, and those are all matters that fall to be taken into account when considering deliverability under footnotes four and five. In terms of the existing situation of the site, uh, and its context. These are considered uh, and set out, as, as, as you'll recall, in the hearing statement. For example, the surrounding use and the industrial uses on adjacent sites have always been known and understood, and you see this uh, at 1.3.23 uh, to 1.3.24 of the hearing statement. Um, and indeed the inspector's report into the CPO in 1982 referenced the surrounding industrial uses. So that was taken into account when the site was acquired in the first place. Uh, and it refers to the um, uh, changes that have taken place since, since acquisition. So far as the proposals for battery storage are concerned, A, that is only a proposal at the moment. The application has yet to be determined. It is to the south east 
of the site on the other side of the current industrial uses, so it's not immediately adjacent to the traveller's site. And indeed, what you do know is that in close proximity to the site is site ST7. So what is proposed in close proximity to the site is residential development, which would be compatible with site expansion. With regard to consideration of the uh, expansion of the site, um, it has always been the case that expansion is to be within existing local authority sites. Uh, the form of H5, which went out at Regulation 19 in 2018, although it didn't name them, uh, they've now been named since, but it, sa it said, uh, will be identified within the existing local authority site. So there was never any question that H5 expansion was going to be anything other than on existing sites. Uh, the fact that we've named them is merely uh, a matter of detail because uh, no one would be unaware of knowing anything about site provision, what those existing sites were. And in fact, the existing sites are listed under the safeguarding provision uh, two paragraphs above. And we keep going back to 2013, 2014. The government guidance which led to the ruling out of the site under the abandoned local plan draft in 2014 was revoked. So the, the uh, assessment of site suitability uh, at the 2014 stage was based on now obsolete government guidance. And you've got that set out, although it doesn't appear to have been read by Mr. Willers, at 1.3.16 and 1.3.17 of the hearing statement. You'll see um, uh, that the uh, identification of the sites so far as the current local plan process was uh, against detailed guidance regarding recommended, um, uh, re regarding uh, uh, suitable sites. And so in, in our respectful submission, A, the points being made about 2014 are, uh, are mis misconceived and are based on outdated material. Secondly, the context of the site has always been there and accepted. Thirdly, the uh, new proposals that are coming forward include an adjacent new housing development. Uh, the battery development will, if it's permitted, will be on the other side. And finally, so far as site conditions, um, the YTT is pushing at an open door for the reasons I explained at the beginning. I appreciate entirely that there may be frustration that this hasn't been addressed earlier, but you'll have seen both from the text to be added to the plan and from the executive report that uh, substantial provision is going to be made in order to address these issues. It may be late in, late in the day uh, and it may uh, be the case that this ought to have been addressed uh, many years ago, but the fact is the question in terms of local plan soundness is, is this deliverable in the light of the current information? And our case to you is that it is, for the reasons I've indicated. So can I just Yes, briefly, please, please do. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I did, I did um, note that the government guidance um, that the... <laughs> decision in 2014 had been based upon, or at least took into account, had been revoked. Um, I'm well aware of that, um, but that's not to say that uh, the guidance and its reference to the need to keep sites to um, a reasonable um, uh, uh, size is not still relevant and correct. And um, the very fact that the guidance has been revoked does not mean that the uh, proposition that one should uh, keep sites within a manageable size um, is, is no longer true. As far as deliverability is concerned, as Mr. Elvin rightly said, um, sites must be in a suitable location. That's what this whole question that you're asking us is about. Is Osbaldwick a suitable location? I would refer you back to PPTS again and to the requirement in paragraph 13, that local authorities should ensure that traveler sites are sustainable economically, socially, and environmentally. And the first subparagraph um, of that uh, 
paragraph 13, states that, uh, therefore, their policies should promote peaceful and integrated coexistence between the site and the local community. And the local community in this instance, um, given the expansion proposed, are those living on the safeguarded site. That it should uh, promote access to appropriate health services, ensure children can attend school on a regular basis, and that it should provide for proper consideration of the effect of local environmental quality, such as noise and air quality, on the health and well-being of any travellers that may locate there or on others as a result of the new development. Well, so you know, if, any, if any site, <laughs> we would suggest, uh, uh, fails in that regard to comply with policy 13, uh, this is it. And so, so, you know, one one really has to just judge what is being suggested against PPTS, the national policy um, relevant to the provision of gypsy and traveller sites. And when one does that, uh, one can see that there are very good reasons for York Travellers Trust putting to you that this um, proposal is not suitable. Um, I don't quibble with the point about the battery storage site. I don't know what type of pollution might arise from such a site, if any. Um, I suppose there might be additional traffic if that were granted permission, but we don't even know if it's going to be. So I don't uh, think we can place much weight on that. Um, Mr. Elvin says, well, it's always been the case that there's been a, uh, a proposal that there be an expansion of sites. And I've, I've read earlier iterations of policy H5 and I see there was reference to three pitches on local authority sites. I'm told that the discussion was all about the expansion of Clifton as opposed to Osbordwick, but you, you and those in this room will know more about what was discussed at an earlier stage before um, the proposal was modified so as to identify four pitches on Osbordwick and six on Clifton. Um, the point made by Mr. Elvin in 1982, when he says in 1982 there was a compulsory purchasing inquiry, really doesn't seem to me to take um, this issue very much further forward. Um, it was always known that industrial site units were adjacent to the site. Well, clearly that's a fact. Um, but uh, we're now looking at the question of whether or not there should be an expansion of Osbordwick to the tune of perhaps 17 more pitches uh, with ongoing environmental harm arising perhaps from unit uses which were or were not generating dust and other pollution um, back in 1982. And, you know, as Mr. Elvin said, quoting him, there's been a lot of water, I think he said, under the bridge since 1982. And we've moved on somewhat, I hope, in terms of what we think is suitable, not just for gypsies and travellers, but for the general population in terms of uh, environmental um, impacts. So, um, so it seems to me that um, you should be guided by PPTS 13, paragraph 13, and what you've seen on the site, uh, what is evident um, without necessarily needing to know much more about it from its location and the um, uses which are uh, adjacent to it to be able to conclude that it does not comply with paragraph 13. Thank you, Mr. Willis. I, I can see a couple, a couple more. Mr. Hargreaves, you go first, because I think you've been waiting for a while. Sorry. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Um, I suppose, listening to this conversation, one of the things I'm very much reminded of is when um, York Traveller Trust, some years ago, this is going back in the sort of ancient history of the local plan, asked me to help, you know, to help them manoeuvre their way through the local plan process. And the thing, one of the things that really struck me about the situation in York is how exceptional the provisional provision for travellers is here in the sense that 
it is all public provision and there is no private traveller provision. Now, if you look at the position nationally, over the last 30 years, I mean, the caravan, the caravan counts, with all their weaknesses, give a very good measure of what's happening to provision for gypsies. Um, there has been hardly any expansion of public sites because of the political difficulties, the funding difficulties, the withdrawal of the responsibility, the duty on local authorities to provide traveler sites. And there has been a really quite huge expansion of private sites. And this surprised me because most of, a lot of my bread and butter job over the last eight, 10 years has been applying for and battling for planning permission for individual families. Now, for whatever reasons, that picture doesn't apply in York, right? Um, and so I'm kind of disturbed by, I think there are profound equity issues about a situation where we're perpetuating a situation where the only provision that this city and this local plan effectively allows is for more what will necessarily, you know, we've heard all this stuff about the executive report and you've got to read it against the financial pressures on local authorities which don't impact, as I understand it, any less on York than other places. York is going to have to make redundancies, reduce services, and at the same time we're told that a large amount of money can be front for funded to resolve the problems of the existing sites. Um, as I say, I have profound, res I, th I, think, I just feel it's the wrong thing to end up a with a plan which perpetuates the situation where the there are only public provision in York. And I know, in a way, uh, you know, we, we went through this in, in, in the July 22 hearing We've heard quite a lot this morning about, you know, counting angels on pinheads on kind of how much need there is and how much of those figures were made up. Um, I think the point I would make, and, and again disturbs me about this, and that we did make in, uh, in front of your colleague, uh, Inspector Barclay, in the summer of 2022, that... Where's the counting of the travellers in housing, right? Nationally, depending on how, what, how you look at it, there's probably like something like two-thirds of gypsy people in housing, right? You know, and York is far from exceptional in that. It has a large house traveller population. Now, I've, I'm sort of currently involved in carrying out a needs assessment in Fenland, which is possibly the district in the country with the highest, not numeric gypsy population, but proportionate gypsy population. And we have surveyed 180 traveller households in housing, which I think is the largest survey of that population in the country. Now, what that brings out is most gypsy, a lot of, no, not a, most, a lot of gypsies who are in housing were forced there because they had no alternatives, right? Quite a few adapt and come to like it, right? Maybe more the women than the men, according to our survey, right? Um, but not all will, right? And a proportion of people will want to travel among young people, you know, 
there's a patronizing assumption in some of the work that's been done, which is that for gypsy people, there is a one-way journey from roadside to site to housing, and only those on sites will want sites. Our evidence is a, a proportion of people in need, overcrowded, intolerant of living in housing, will want sites. And I'm disturbed that the evidence that, I mean, I know we've, we looked at it two summers ago, but I'm disturbed that that community is not factored into the analysis we're hearing today. Um, yeah, thank you. Mr. Hargreaves, is that, is that a point that goes back to what we talked about earlier about need? And where, the, the solution to that would be, as, as we discussed, I, I, absolutely redo so. the GTA. A, a I mean, I would say a proper survey which, rather than, I mean, rather than just focusing on the three council sites, is explicit that you look at all the potential sources of need. And again, that's why the 2014 survey by ORS is significantly better because it identifies some need from housing and it identifies some need from unauthorized development. And given that we've now flicked back um, to the pre-2015 definition, other things being equal, I mean, and that, and as, as I remember it, the 2014 survey indicated a net need for 10 pitches from house travelers. You know, other things being equal, now we've gone through the period from 2015 to 2023 on the sort of definition as it was, I see no reason why that shouldn't be the bait, shouldn't be a, you know, give you a, a rough figure. It's not accurate, of course, but it, it indicates to me in principle that we should be expecting a strand of need from uh, gypsy people living in houses, a lot of whom are unhappy in living or have significant reservations about living in housing. Thank you. I understand, Mr. Hargreaves. Thank you. Councillor Waters, did you, uh, are you stood up for a... Yeah. Yeah, go on, carry on. Thank you, sir. Just a couple of points of clarification. Um, Travellers Trust um, KC again, and I'm, I keep referring to them as that because I'm not sure whether to say Villars or, or Willers. Sorry. It, it's Willers. Thank Willers, you. Yeah, like Thank Willowers, you. But Willers. Uh, you mentioned access to services, and it's just reminded me to, to point out that on the council's um, uh, hearing statement appendix, there's a, a map that's got traveller site at Osborwick and GP surgeries. The GP surgery that's closest to the site that's marked up on this map closed can't remember whether it was eight or nine years ago so that is incorrect so so I'm, I'm, I'm glad the KC's jogged my memory with that one um, in terms of the battery storage application um, <coughs> it might be worthwhile you just perusing that planning file I know you've got loads to do with all this but that is tw 23 slash o 20 30 slash F-U-L-M. The Council's Highways um, people have echoed objections and concerns by um, surrounding residents and the parish councils and virtually stated that the proposed access is completely unsuitable. Should that application be amended, then the only possible way to access that site for construction and future maintenance would be down out gang lane adding to the industrial uh, turmoil enjoyed by the occupants of the site thank you sir thank you councillor waters uh, mr Evan, is it you'll want to come back on on some of that that we've just heard obviously then i want to ask a couple of questions but go on 
Uh, firstly, so far as bricks and mortar are concerned, and Mr. Hargreaves' lengthy points about that, this is dealt with its CYC88 again, the 2022 needs assessment, paragraphs 3, God, my eyesight's gone, 317 to 319, internal page 18. And you'll see that it says that a, a rigorous approach was taken uh, to that. So that, that, that has been dealt with. Secondly, so far as some of Mr. Willer's submissions are concerned, firstly, it would be unlawful to rely on revoked government guidance. So I'm not sure entirely where his point goes. The assessment as to the suitability of the site is made according to the PPTS. Um, Mr. Willer's is very happy to look at paragraph 13, but ignores the tests in footnotes four and five, which I've already referred you to and I won't go into again, against which you then have to look at what the council proposes to do. I'd also add to that, one shouldn't forget that the nearest development to this site will be ST7. And you have at paragraph 1.3.27 of the hearing statement, uh, of course, the fact that it will be the boundary uh, for ST7 is about 150 metres to the north, and SS9 requires a master planning of a new garden facility with local facilities, which will increase accessibility and connectivity to both local facilities and public transport, and will therefore promote the requirements of paragraph 13 of the PPTS. Uh, as for private site provision, I, I didn't frankly understand what Mr. Hargreaves meant, but the whole purpose of the policy is, uh, first of all, to require provision to be made on the strategic sites, which will be private sites. And you're familiar with that and uh, familiar with my resistance on behalf of the council to watering down H5. And uh, as for the location of GP surgeries, well, you've got a plan as to where they are. Ignoring ST7 for a moment, of course, the facilities are no further away than they are for the existing site. Uh, and indeed, it's proposed to improve the facilities in the way that I've already mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Ralvin. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't see your. Thank you, Ms. Cannon. Did, did you want to say yeah, something? Sorry, I'm just recovering from the rigorous search that um, they carried out for housed. Sorry. <coughs> so, just just to come back to Michael's comment about the housed population of York, he can only speak anecdotally from his evidence nationally. I could speak as a person that works locally. The vast majority of the people we work with are housed gypsies and travellers, and they've not gone into housing by choice. They've gone into housing because the option is Oswaldwick or Clifton. You can't get on James Street. It's one of the premium sites in York. So the idea that um, we're going to go, okay, we're not going to count the housed because we rigorously tried to find them and we couldn't. Um, but yeah, I can't even c c sort of comprehend the sentence that I'm trying to say because it just, it's almost like it's saying, well, it, it's okay for them because, you know, Let's just ignore them. They're not worth the effort to try and find them. They're not worth the effort to give them anything culturally appropriate. It's, it's offensive, particularly when you look at the amount of housed people that we work with with mental health problems. We, ha we implemented an emotional well-being therapist who would work with the families to explore um, trauma. And every person that has worked with this approved, appointed, educated woman has stated housing, accommodation, and the lack of suitable, appropriate housing for the start of their mental health problems, including those on sites who feel like they're, they're devalued by the poor quality and the options that they have. So by saying it's good enough for them now, so let's just extend it, just reinforces that message to our clients that they're not worth the effort, that they're best out of sight, that's where they belong.
So, sorry, can I just follow up on the, um, the, the housed gypsies and travellers? You remember in opening, I, I mentioned the fact that in 2014 there was um, a figure of 66. That was the provision identified. There's been no additional pitches uh, created since then. And that 2014 assessment by the very same organisation, ORS, included, as Mr Hargrew said, 10 pitches from those living in housing of the, uh, you know, who are uh, um, uh, displaying the concerns raised by um, Violet Cannon as she just um, articulated. And, and so the question you might ask yourself is, how can it be explained in, what was it, paragraph 3.17 to 3.19 of the 2022 Gypsy and Traveller Accommodation Assessment, um, where, which Mr. Elvin indicates was a rigorous approach taken by ORS on this occasion, that that figure of 10 was actually reduced to zero when there was no, no, as I understand it, interviews with anybody in housing. Had the exercise been carried out appropriately, professionally, properly, no doubt ORS could have contacted York Travellers Trust and ask them to put them in touch with some of those people that they work with who are living in houses that uh, Violet Cannon just identified. Instead, we've just got a zero figure against those in housing without any justification, without any explanation. And that's why we say this uh, policy cannot be considered to be sound without a proper GTAA. It needs a robust evidence base. Paragraph 7C of PPTS requires local authorities to use a robust evidence base to establish accommodation needs to inform the preparation of local plans and make planning decisions. And unfortunately, it doesn't matter which way you move the deck chairs, as it were, around this sinking plan, we don't have a robust evidence base. Sorry to use that um, unfortunate uh, analogy. But, you know, we're window dressing here. That's another way of putting it. I'm afraid it's just papering over the cracks. I mean, there are many ways I can describe it, but um, that's unfortunately the situation we're in. But again, the answer to that would be go back, do the GTA exactly. again. Yeah. E exactly, sir. And, um, uh, um, you know, perhaps with a, you know, a better brief, perhaps with more time to, uh, to um, I examine the issue, ORS were only given, I think, a three-month window in which to do so. And in fact, it was during the travelling season, so, you know, not the best time of the year. Um, with access to those that work with York Travellers Trust, so it's in cooperation there, you know, rather than what we have, which is pretty much a desktop um, study with some proxy information, um, you know, straight to the horse's mouth, we will get um, a true indication of the level of need in York. I, I think I've got, I've got a good grasp of where we are on this, on this question of need. I mean, properly, Mr. Elvin, if there's anything you want to say, but I, I would like to move away from that and talk about well, some other questions. Can, that I, I, can I just say, Mr. Willer's proposed solution, oh, we need another GTAA, it will get us nowhere. All it will do is mean that we don't have a plan and the travellers will not be protected because there will be no policy in place. I don't know what Mr. Willers thinks he's doing, but it seems to me to be counterproductive. He fails to read the proper wording of government policy. He doesn't read the statements that the council has put in. And we've just had grossly misrepresented what CYC 88 to 3.17 to 3.19 says. I'm not going to read it out. I'll leave it to you to go back over it. What was rigorous is the approach to making contact with those in bricks and mortar. You can read what it says for yourself, and I'm not going to read it out. And uh, the, the fact that no one troubles to read these documents and then makes sweeping statements about them does not assist you or the plan process. Thank you, sir. Look, I, I'd, like to move, I'd like to move this on, if I may, but go, go on, one more then. Sorry, I, sorry, I was... No. Um, I'm just going to... Okay. Just, sorry, I just uh, want to... Yeah, no, sorry, I'd already committed 
Mr. Owens said that uh, the GTA is sort of, um, it's not relevant. And if we don't, if we can't adopt the plan, there will be no policy for travellers. Now, you began this, this morning, Mr. Owen, by telling us that the council's plan for travellers is the continuous expansion of Oswaldwick. So, and that's what we're here to discuss. You know, we'd rather not see the plan adopted in that form. Um, and, and that's what we're doing here. So, you, you know, maybe you make a valid point that the numbers are sort of something that we need to go away and think about. But the point is that whatever the number is, the council's plan is to meet all of the need at Oswaldwick. That's what our problem is today. So, I think, um, yeah, that's, that's helpful. Um, but I understand the points that have been made about um, need and the GTAA, but we've heard, we've heard about that. Um, well, I'd like to move the, the conversation on a little bit because um, I think it's inc incumbent on me to, to rehearse what happens if I, I take the view, or Simon and I take the view, Mr. Barclay and I t take the view, sorry, that um, you know, for, on the basis of what we saw yesterday, um, for the sake, for the sake, just, just bear with me. Let's just assume that we, we saw what we saw yesterday at the Osbaldwick site, and we come away with the, the conclusion that it's not suitable for expansion. Um, what I'd, what I'd like to put to the council is. Um, What's our position? What's our position then, plan-wise? If we come to that conclusion, what are our options, really? There aren't any. We, we put forward what we regard as a constructive approach, both to improving site conditions, um, providing uh, the removal of, of potential green belt obstructions by what I said first, uh, and by uh, an approach which will uh, engage, as you'll see from the executive report, with future site searches. But you have uh, sufficient evidence to demonstrate that 10 years have not thrown up any alternative sites that aren't in the green belt. You know what the position is with the green belt. And we, we suggest that having regard to the tests in paragraphs four and five of the footnotes of the PPTS, you have sufficient information to find it sound. And the best that can be um, perhaps achieved if you think there's a problem, apart from declaring the plan unsound, in which case nobody is assisted, um, is uh, to recommend that there is, uh, that the council takes forward its, uh, the position in its executive report uh, as soon as possible. But it seems to me it's a, it's, um, it's a council of gloom to suggest uh, that uh, to adopt the, gyps the Gypsian uh, Travellers uh, Association's uh, submissions will simply lead to kicking this into the long grass. York has struggled to get a local plan up and running. Um, it needs to get it up and running. And uh, to meet what are, frankly, um, ill put together suggestions about numbers by Mr. Willis this morning w against a situation where we've had a series of need assessments over the last 10 years, of which you've got copies of them all, and to suggest that this somehow isn't a sound evidence base when nothing is put forward other than generalizations uh, and a constant reliance on uh, material put forward 11 years ago, in my respectful submission, is not a reasonable approach for the uh, YTT to adopt, and it's not a reasonable approach to determining the soundness of the plan either. So I'm, I'm sorry for strong words, but that's how I see it. Just be clear though, I, I mean, let's, let's say for example that one accepts that the, the GTA that is before us um, is the best that we're gonna get, and there's nothing, there, there's no purpose in, in sort of going at that again. Starting, starting from scratch and producing a new one, but we, we could accept the numbers in the GTAA, but then have a, have a concern about um, expanding Oswaldwick to meet, to meet that identified need. Is, is there any option, any easy, or <laughs> any, no, any option that we, we would have to, to, to kind of explore that position? Is there anything we could do? Other than my suggestion that of recommending it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Problem: You turn the volume up too high, and you get feedback. Um, 
other than a recommendation of adoption and then an early review. I can't think of any constructive approach other than that. And that would sit, if you felt that that was the correct way forward, that would sit with what is said in the executive report uh, at paragraph 30, which says a work stream will be established to identify and assess alternative sites. As I said, we have not been able to identify ones that are not Greenbelt sites within the plan process period and before. And you have the reasons for that. But of course you have set against that also the requirements of the strategic sites to deliver provision or to find alternatives. And it provides uh, a very strong basis for rejecting the suggestions of watering down those policies by some of the site promoters. If anything is required, it is um, that, that that duty in policy remain. Thank you, Mr. Relvin. Uh, Mr. Mr. Willis, do you have, I mean, if I put the same question to you? Yeah. The, um I'm not going to rise to the Mr. Elwin debate in terms of my um, submissions. Um, you've, you've got both of us, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but what I am going to do is uh, say that um, it, even if you accept the GTA AA, despite our criticisms, but conclude that Osbaldwick is not appropriate, I think you're being told that's that's it. It's a fait accompli. You know, it's it's Osbaldwick or nothing. Um, apart from perhaps an early review uh, with adoption. Um, Mr. Elvin says the council has not been able to identify sites. I think he said not in the green belt. Now, I'd invite you and your colleague to go back over the evidence relating to the search for sites and this whole point that you and your colleague raised in correspondence about the, there being no need for exceptional circumstances. I put all this in my opening, so you, I'm, I'm somewhat repeating what I said, but my understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong, that in fact there hasn't been a, I would say proper, but a, a search for sites which includes land in the green belt um, since 2014 for sites which would be capable of being allocated for traveller pitches. And certainly not one since uh, you and your colleague identified the fact that there's no need for exceptional circumstances. And so um, we would respectfully submit that um, as we set out in a hearing statement you do have the option as have uh, other inspectors in other examinations of issuing a partial report but re uh, one which requires this local authority to go back and identify or at least carry out a proper site selection search for sites rather than, as it were, present one option and one option only, which is an expansion of an unsuitable site. Is that a similar approach to an early review? Is it, I've not come across, I've not come across that before. This is the approach identified in the, I think it was. Chorley. Yeah, Chorley. so in the, it's in the Chorley local plan, uh, the inspector was able to make a partial report and, and do it that way. The problem with an early review is, and, and this is a question I, I sort of wanted to ask following what Mr. Elvin uh, has said, is if we have not been able to find sites for traveller sites that aren't in the green belt, when it hasn't yet been defined, what help is it going to be to have an early review when we have defined it and we, have, and we do have to meet those very special circumstances tests? and the exceptional circumstances and so forth. So it sounded very much to me like the major reason why we, you're being asked to find the plan is sound is everybody else's interests depend on us compromising the interests of our clients. And we're not prepared to do that, obviously. So, you know, we need to make that clear. This idea of a sort of an early review having defined the green belt, which has been the issue, is only gonna make things much, much more difficult, I would have thought, for us. And also it means, uh, where's the urgency? in term for the council in actually dealing with this issue after that so uh, sorry did i answer your did i answer your question 
there. Yes, that is helpful. I mean, yeah. my m previous experience of, of early reviews, um, when they've been put into, into policy, um, they can go into a policy, but then there's always a question of whether, it, whether that early review actually takes place. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying for a moment that that would be what would happen here, um, but there are places where that kind of policy has been put in, and not just on provision for gypsies and travellers either, um, and it hasn't happened. So, um, yeah, one, one is, you know, if you're going to do an early review, it's, it would have to be a last resort, I think. From, without That's right. I think our, our, we are very, we are, whilst we, everybody knows what we do, our client base is gypsies and travellers in York, we're, we're absolutely aware that the, the city needs a local plan and that house building needs to commence. Like that, that needs to happen. So a lot of the effort that we've put into this whole situation is what kind of a solution might we come up with that, that meets everybody's interests, but without compromising our interests, without sacrificing them to the sort of the greater good. Because as a minority community, you know, we accept that once, we accept it every time. It's only ever going to be like that for us. You know, we can't do that. The, the idea that happened in Chorley, where the, the, the inspector made a partial report, meant that having been able to give significant weight to those sort of strategic site policies and various other different... Pe people could put in their planning applications, c development could commence, but the plan hadn't been adopted yet. We do have an obligation to have an adopted plan, as far as I'm aware, in the city. I think that's been an issue. Uh, so we would so we would still need to solve the problem before we, before we finish thinking about it, and I think that's why... That's where we're coming from. And, and you know, I, I will say, it's not my job to solve these problems. Um, I've spent a lot of time trying to do that. And I've, and I've spent a lot of time doing that in a way that tries to meet everybody's needs. Actually, if the council, if the council has better ideas about how to solve the problem, please do bring them forward. But at the moment, we're being told that we're not going to solve your problem. In order to so solve our problem, we're going to anticipate either not providing traveller sites that are needed or putting them all on... Osbordwick, which is just, which is just, isn't it acceptable for four? But when you think about the, the sort of uh, what's going to happen when the when the strategic sites start demonstrating that it's not viable to put them there, it's not just four; it's all of the sites coming forward during the whole process of the local plan are going to end up channeled through to Osbordwick. Um, you know, that's that's where we're at, really. That's helpful. Um, th just, I mean, I'm not. I want to explore, for, for my own um, purposes, um, in terms of having, having some clarity about, I'm not saying one is going to go down this path, but let's, let's just say, for the sake of argument, that we looked at early review. Um, I, I just want to be very clear about how that might work, because plan, plan is, w the plan would be adopted, um, with a policy that talks about an early review. So upon adoption of the plan, the green belt boundaries would be set. So then we have York with a, with a green belt. Then we have an early review, which requires some sort of um, site search and um, what, might come, what might come forward in or, in or out of the, of the green belt. Could that early review change green belt boundaries, for, for example? Is that something that's possible? Under the, because I, I think it, it might be that we're under a new legislative framework when the early review takes place. Who knows? Uh, I don't think it's, uh, it seems unlikely because you'd normally need a, a full local plan review to review green belt boundaries and you would be proceeding in the basis that the green belt boundaries you were fixing were not there to endure for a significant period of time. So it would run directly contrary to national policy. So I think that would be a, a difficulty. The problem, the problem with the suggestion that we need to go back and look at it is effectively you're abandoning the local plan at that stage because if we have to revisit the green belt, we have to revisit all the sites. You can't just do it as an isolated issue. And to do this uh, for this particular issue appears to be not only inappropriate and contrary to policy, but disproportionate as well. And it is in the interests of all, I would respectfully suggest, that this plan proceeds to adoption um, because otherwise boundaries are not fixed, provision is not made, there is no power to adopt part of a plan 
you either recommend that the plan is sound or it isn't sound. Um, and uh, I, I, I've not been able to find the, uh, the Chorley position. I think it's central Lancashire now anyway. Um, but uh, whatever, the, a, a partial report only means that you haven't actually satisfied the examiner that the plan is sound as a whole. Um, and that is just kicking everything into the long grass again, which in my submission is contrary to the, uh, to the uh, public interest. And the suggestion that is being made will undermine the plan as a whole because you would have to revisit strategic allocations, you'd have to revisit boundaries and go through all that process that we've spent so long going through before now. And you'll recall all the detailed discussions we had about individual green belt boundaries, that would all have to be reopened. Effectively, it would mean an abandonment of the plan, and that is, we submit, unacceptable. And we've offered a, a way forward. Uh, the Council has recognised that Oswaldwick needs serious attention, hence the report to executive, hence the big change from previous, uh, the previous position, and the acceptance of the need to forward fund by the Council. That is not only in the interests of the travelling community who live there and those who uh, may wish to live there in the future, but it's also in the interests of securing um, the uh, conclusion to this examination and the adoption of the plan. Thank you, Mr. Alvin. Um, I don't quite know how to put this, but are there any, uh, any other suggestions, Mr. Willis? Do you have any alternatives beyond a partial review? Are there any other, uh, any other roads? I saw, saw a uh, a sort of, I, I, don't, I don't mean this, well, there was a, a kind of a hint, let's put it like that, about, about doing something with the exceptions policy. Is there any mileage in that? So, firstly, can I just say that um, it seems from the council's point of view, an earlier review is out of the question because it won't, it, it won't achieve, I mean, whether that's right or not is another matter, but, but certainly the council don't advocate that. So that... That. Actually, Mr. Willis is, is talking nonsense, if you'll forgive me. We say in the executive report that there will be a working group to, to look immediately at new site provision. And forgive me, that's, the not paragraph a, number. that's not an early review of the plan. Um, that's something completely different outside of the plan. And you're concerned with the soundness of the plan itself. That's, that, it, the, what, what goes on in the executive committee is... is you know, could make real difference to those living on the current Osbaldwick site. Let's hope it does. Let's hope the, the council really does, as it expresses it, has a genuine interest um, and commitment to doing just that. But that has nothing to do with the future provision of pitches, um, as, as, as you'll appreciate. Um, so we're really looking at um, how else to perhaps keep this show on the road. And... I did indicate an, an, an opening, and I didn't do it off the, you, you, you know, off, off the top of my head, that we could have an exceptions policy. There was an exceptions policy which was subsequently withdrawn because the council considered on advice, no doubt from the gentleman sitting opposite, that um, PPTS wouldn't allow that exceptions policy to be uh, a, a adopted. I don't agree with the advice given by my learned friends to the local authority. Um, we rarely agree on many things, Mr. Alvin, Mr. Henson and I, but I don't agree with it. And I think you should consider carefully, although ultimately it's for the council to put forward modifications um, uh, and, and for you to determine whether they're sound, um, whether or not, in fact, policy E, I think it is, of PPTS, does preclude a, an, exception, an exceptions policy in respect of Greenbelt site provision, because I don't think it does. I think it makes it clear that um, gypsy and traveller sites are considered to be inappropriate in the Greenbelt. There's no argument about that. Um, but that doesn't preclude their provision, providing, of course, very special circumstances exist. The harm by reason of inappropriateness is clearly outweighed by uh, other material considerations. We all know that to be the case because we've all either sat in judgment or advanced or opposed applications in the Greenbelt. And in this local authority area, 
sites are inevitably going to be found in the green belt or in land that is taken out of the green belt as it currently exists. And um, this isn't just a point that I'm making, or indeed York Travellers Trust, but also um, uh, I'm trying to read his work, his name, Mr. Natkus in um, uh, Stantec. And it's a reasonable suggestion, and indeed it was proposed initially by this local authority as a way of ensuring that gypsy and traveller sites could be located uh, in this borough, private provision, whether it be by individual applicants or indeed by um, uh, developers. And um, there is a precedent for it, as I said in opening. It is, in fact, the precedent of the Oswald Wick expansion in 2013, where this council itself decided that very special circumstances existed, given the lack of site provision, the lack of alternative alternatives for that site provision and the unmet need. And I'm suggesting that um, that could be written in as an exceptions policy, providing that, um, at least as far as the Greenbelt um, policy in, in, in uh, PPTS is concerned, very special circumstances will exist in this borough or in this council's area, so long as there is an unmet need, there is a lack of alternatives identified in the plan in accordance with paragraph 10A, and there is a personal need for the site on behalf of the applicants. That doesn't necessarily then mean that each and every application made will be granted because there is a whole host of criteria in policy H5C. Now that seems to me to be a perfectly a, a appropriate way forward in these exceptional circumstances where this council, on our case, providing you accept it, have not yet met paragraph 10A of PPTS because they haven't identified sufficient sites, deliverable sites, to meet the five-year supply um, uh, uh, um, identified by the uh, assessment of gypsy and traveller accommodation needs. So, you know, it would provide also, you might think, an incentive on the part of the local authority to do that job properly, carry out a, another assessment of need if you consider that to be appropriate, and also a search for sites now. Um, and um, up until the time when that site survey has been undertaken and additional pitches have been identified where they can be developed, well then that very special circumstances policy would at least give gypsies and travellers the opportunity to um, uh, apply for planning permission for sites in the Greenbelt with a a reasonable prospect of success, providing they comply with the other criteria in H5C. As I said, that's, a, that's not just my suggestion. I see that it's also um, something that has been advanced, perhaps in, different, in, a, in a slightly different form in, in the Stantec submissions, which you'll have read. Well, well let's hear from Mr. Nakas. Go on. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, we... we put this forward on a, on a slightly different premise because it was linked to the strategic sites um, because we we had discussions about looking at alternatives um, th this isn't a, a watering down of that requirement as, as I think was inferred earlier we, we're looking at delivering those sites in accordance with the policies and I won't go into the details of strategic sites but the principle of the policy allocating that site lists what needs to be included including open space housing education etc it doesn't, in the allocation, require gypsy provision. That's provided under H5. So when we're looking at what can fit on site, it isn't a case of choosing what the most preferable thing is, it's looking at the policies, and H5 provides a cascade approach. So actually, putting everything on site that the strategic allocation needs and providing a commuted summer on off-site site is fully policy compliant with the allocation and H5. To omit, for example, open space or a playing field or a school and provide gypsy provision would actually mean we don't comply with the strategic allocation but we comply with H5. So you almost, in terms of what goes on the site, the gypsies is the element that wouldn't be provided because of the way the policies are worded and that's where we started out looking at this from because we were having conversations with the council 
who are effectively saying, well, you can't do anything because it would be on Greenbelt. You can't provide a community sub because it would be on Greenbelt. But actually, there's no alternative to meeting that, which is, which is how, our, how this came about. So we, we sort of had the conversation with the council, well, you just approve an off-site requirement or do a commuted sum and approve things under VSCs. It's pretty straightforward. You know, in reality, VSCs are a decision for the decision maker. It can be anything. There's, there's nothing that's, you know, unless it's perverse and somebody's going to legally challenge it, but to identify alternative need isn't. And we've made reference in our representations to renewables. And it's interesting, we were talking about the battery scheme earlier, just near the Osbaldwick site, which is in the green belt and has a case that there's a need for renewables, there's no alternative provision, it has to go in the green belt. And we've seen loads of appeals that pass that. Um, so, so we put forward that actually there could be an exception policy. Um, I know Mr. Elvin earlier referenced paragraph 16 where he said it's unlikely, and, and I agree, I'm a planner, it, it says that, but it says it's unlikely. It doesn't say that it cannot constitute VSCs. And the reason that it says it's unlikely is because this is looking at the whole of the country and that policy applying everywhere. So if we just look over the border to Selby, for example, about 10% of the whole of Selby is Greenbelt. So if we were having this conversation there, it would be highly unlikely that VX, VSCs exist to put a site within the green belt because 90% of the rest of the countryside is just countryside where you could, could make a submission. But we don't have that in York. And the reason we don't have it in York is because this local plan's identified the inner boundary, tightly drawn around every single settlement and the inner boundary, and provides no white land, as we've discussed at length before, provides no open countryside. It's a binary approach of you're green belt or you're not green belt. Now that's fine. And we've gone through those boundaries, and this isn't reopening them at all. So we have to take the approach that, well, anything outside of an urban area is Greenbelt, which is completely different. I think it's probably unique to York, just because of the nature of the size of the authority and the Greenbelt. I, Mr. Elvin shaking his head, so there might be another. It might be Chester or somewhere like that. I don't know. Windsor and Maidenhead, there Guildford, <laughs> Waverley. I mean, yeah. I can, you, you, the list is yeah. as long as your arm. So, so there are others, but, but the point is, in those, lo in those areas, the likeliness that VSCs would exist is far higher than elsewhere. So whilst it's unlikely, that doesn't prohibit it. And it doesn't stop us from putting exceptions uh, policy in. So I think it, it is something that could be done. It's also worth mentioning, I've had a look at the, the, the exec committee, I think, which has said, oh, we're going to do a search. But with respect, what's the point? Because it's, it's going to be in the green belt. So if you do the search and say, we found a site, because let's be honest again, Searches have been done in the past and the site hasn't come forward. But there's every chance that a site was dismissed, might have been dismissed because a landowner thought, I fancy my chances for housing here. And as soon as this plan's adopted and it isn't coming forward for housing, they might think, oh, well, actually, plan B, here we go. So, so there's every chance that that search, which I think is a useful thing to do, and I think the council should be commended for doing it, will throw up some sites. But if the sites are in the green belt, the council's own evidence for not putting in an exception policy almost dismisses the ability for them to grant planning permission on any of those sites because they just go VSCs don't exist, paragraph 16. So I think, for me, the simple way out of it is just to put an exceptions policy in, which enables these conversations to be had. It adopts a plan, it gives the certainty, but it means that conversations keep having, if other sites come forward, the policy then allows it to be allocated. And it seems to me sort of the strategic site concerns that we've had about the ability to meet on site and, and, and make a commuted sum, it seems to deal with that. To an extent, putting aside the expansion of the Osbaldwick, it seems to deal with this side of the room's issues, and it sort of deals with the council's issues because they get an adopted plan, which is what they want. So for me, it seems the best way forward, but that's your decision to make, ultimately. I, I would stress that all I'm, all I'm doing here at the moment is just rehearsing the, the various options so that when I, when I go away, I've got a very clear idea of what they, what they might be. Um, but it, there are a number of provisos before, before I get there. I mean, obviously, you know, I, th there's a process to, that, to that, um, that line of thinking. If, if I accept something here, then that leads to this, which leads to this, which leads to that, and so on. You'll understand. Mr. Mr. Butler. Thank you, sir. Just to come back on, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of strategic sites more so, it's, um, that approach wouldn't unravel anything. The policy is still there. There's a commitment from developers to accord with that policy. We're not trying to water down that policy in terms of the references, the changes I'm seeking to make in, in my reps. They're to give everyone the flexibility that we've talked about today. I think I, I've, I've written down we had four additional options to the one I proposed just this morning. 
So the flex I'm trying to build into the policy gives us all of us the opportunity to work together. I think, I think since I did my main mods comments in last Feb 23, I've had far more discussions with both the council and, and Abbey, you, and, the, and the, you know, York Travellers Trust. So we have a better understanding as developers what those requirements are too. So the, the, the sort of the, the, the changes we're seeking to make is to provide that further flexibility so you've got that across the whole plan period. And that leads back into the exceptions policy too, to that extent too. So it, it just, it, it's not watering things down, it's giving us all the potential to get a plan adopted to deliver those benefits we're talking about, to deliver those, those, those housing. Every, every day we sit here, more people probably fall into housing need across every spectrum of this, this city. So it's all, all focused on getting a, a plan adopted that, that tries to meet the city's holistic housing needs, but doing so in a manner that means, means we can all work together. Um, to deliver them in, in the manner that people want them delivered in. And that includes the ability for the council to get an SPD adopted, which provides further details. It includes the ability for the council to search their own sites. I mean, we're, we're talking about the, the exceptions policies there. There might be other, other sites that could be found that have, have buildings on them already, so would, would already f fulfill the requirements of the framework in that respect. So that's all the, all the changes that we were seeking to sort of make as well in terms of those, those modifications we proposed. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Can Councillor Waters. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I, I'm just sort of sat here in absolute amazement, really, that, you know, uh, you, yourself and Mr. Barclay must have had serious concerns to be asking the questions you've been asking for some time now on this subject, and serious concerns to have called these phase five hearing sessions. And yet, the best the council can come up with is basically options choice, except Oswaldwick for all the expansion or the plan fails, and that's how they're trying to twist everybody's arm with this. I just don't think it's acceptable at all. Um, there were alternative sites identified in 2014, but there wasn't the political will to take any of them forward. So, on the subject of political will, and all the mention of this executive report, what political will can there be amongst the new Labour administration when numerous submissions that the Labour group have made to this local plan process, they've said every single time they are opposed to expansion of the Oswaldwick site. So how is that going to work out? I'm, I'm loath to use the term that Mr. Elvin did, calling somebody else's uh, responses nonsense, but uh, with relation to nonsense, and I go on to this executive report, um, the finances to me are nonsense. I, I just do, do not believe in the current climate how the council can be talking to, talking about front-loading uh, development and taking on additional borrowings. Um, but the thing that really struck me on this executive report was um, paragraph 21 uh, and, and 22, should I say. But anyway, just, just to sum up where, where I'm getting to, I think if, you, if you're breaking for lunch, I think some of the people on the council side need to have a really good think and come back in the afternoon session with something sensible. Because... Oswaldwick as an only option is not sensible. From Mr Hargreaves, um, Ms Cannon, briefly if we can, because yes, I would like to break, and I'd like to talk about how we do that. Go on. Yeah, thank you, sir. Putting myself in your shoes, I can maybe see some of the dilemma, right? Because... Very special circumstances for traveller development in Greenbelt are frequently found, but that's in relation to individual Section 78 appeals. I'm not aware of it. I can see how you might see there being a, a conflict with national policy in writing it into a plan. That's quite a dilemma, yeah? Um, if you don't, if, you know, 
I'm not saying which way you should go, right? I can see both sides. But if you feel or work it out, like however you get legal advice internally within PINs or whatever, sorry, um, you come to the conclusion that that's not a viable solution, I think you have to find this plan unsound and I would strongly, strongly urge you against allowing an early review. An early review for travellers never happens, right? F indicate your, I would urge you to, if, to indicate your reservations and get the council to do the work properly and quickly, to do a quick needs assessment and do an effective site search. I mean, I, I think Mr. Elwin's claim that the search has been done and nothing was found is not convincing. I think, as Council, Councillor Waters said, if you look at the history, the City Council was looking at potential uh, traveller sites going back, May, I'm not sure, of the, uh, around 2013, 2014, I think, or maybe a little after that, there was then a change in, in administration because the then Labour group was, was trying to put in too much housing and for about, for the successive years, looking for new traveller sites was off the agenda. So the attempt has not been made. And so I would urge you, if you come to the conclusion that the, the exceptions policy doesn't work, this is a personal view, it's not necessarily a team view as it were, you need to, get, uh, you need to publish a partial report saying most of the plan is, a, is sound and carries significant weight and urge the council to do the work properly to come up with a proper needs assessment that looks all the, all, at all the sources of need and in parallel do a proper site search. That's something of a personal view. Great, thank you. Ms Cannon. Um, I just feel like I need to say that I feel like the conversations I have with the local authority leaders are slightly at odds with what Mr Elving is saying to us. It feels very, a very different conversation that's happening. And with regards to, is it Natka, sorry? Um, his idea that the exceptions policy would get the local authority a plan approved. In my view, it gets them more than that. It gets them the things that they've been saying to us, which is we don't want to expand Oswaldwick. So it's win-win in my view. And I, I do wish that Mr Elving would have a chat with the council leaders in I the have done. break. Thank you. In the break, it would be. I didn't realise we could talk over each other. Sorry. No, I'm just correcting you I wasn't because aware I of have. That. I have um, spoken, and the council leader is watching this. Thank you, Ms. Cannon. Mr. Natkus, did you have anything you wanted to add? So it was just a very quick point. So I think Mr. Hargreaves just just um, prompted me on it. I, I think you actually in the report saying this would be VSCs. I think that was the point he was making. Would be quite tricky but actually my representations don't say that the exception policy should explicitly say that it was more to analyze that subsection c which ref references planning applications would be amended to say should sites be in the green belt obviously it would need to show vscs however if there was unmet need that could constitute vscs which effectively wouldn't be explicitly saying any application in the green belt anywhere has vscs it would still be for the applicant to prove that However, the policy, and that's in line with what the framework does on renewables, which is to say it could constitute it. So it's still a decision for the decision maker based on the circumstances at the time. And I think it's important for that so that at the end of the plan period, or maybe in 52 years when we get another new plan, we, we don't still have, you know, the, the 10,000 site coming forward. Oh, VSCs exist because it says it in this policy. It would just still be a site-by-site -site assessment that you would have to make, but the policy would imply that that could be the case, which would give the certainty to everybody, I think without making your life difficult of setting the precedent for something. That's interesting. Thank you, Mr. Nackers. Mr. Elvin, did you want to sort of sum up now before we break for lunch, or would you no, prefer I to break I, for lunch? I, I think, I think uh, a little protein in between might be a good yeah, idea. Yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Let's break for lunch then, will, and uh, we'll come back. Could I just... Will this... Is, is, is this then... Does this then deal with all your MIQs? Are there any remaining matters? Well, beyond that, there are a few brief um, questions I wanted to cover about, um, about other, the other site. Um, 
that, that, that's proposed for expansion in Clifton. I just want to ask a few brief things about that, but beyond that, no, not very much. Um, but, I mean, what, what, what would everyone prefer in terms of a break? No, we can't. Yeah. Um, can we have an hour, please? Yeah. I'm content with that, yeah. Um, so, can I just indicate, I, I wasn't intending to, and you may not have allowed me to anyway, to sum up our case, because I think I put it in the opening and it's pretty much been reflected, I hope, by what's been said. But um, So, I'm not going to take up any more time than is absolutely necessary and only respond to perhaps in brief to anything said by Mr. Holbein. I'm content with that. There are, there are a few, I'm going to have a think about this as well over the, over the break and that's why I think an hour is is sensible um, for everyone and then we'll come back I have some questions and, and but yes I, I'm hoping that after lunch um, we needn't be too long but no I, I don't certainly don't want to hear closings or anything like that but there are a few things that we still need to cover I'm, I'm gonna break until 10 past 2 okay thanks everyone that's been very helpful this morning until 10 past brilliant